Welcome to this week's episode of Being Human. I'm here with Robert Meyer. He's the Professor of Marketing at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania and co-director of the Risk Management and Decision Making Processes Center. Good morning. Have I got that okay, right? That is, yeah, yeah. Well, close enough. Okay, it's, it's close enough. So uh, good morning. How are you? Or good I'm morning for well. me. It's good morning for you and it's good afternoon uh, yeah. for me. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's a delight to have you on here. You're also, of course, the, the co-author of the book, The Ostrich Paradox, which I have yeah. read and thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, so yes, it's a, it's a delight to have you. Um, so let's talk people through, uh, yeah, the ost- ostrich paradox. Um, what's, a, a, in, firstly, you know, the background for that, that book and the, and the genesis of that book? Yeah, um, it's interesting. I, I, I've always had a kind of an interest. I just, a lot of my work is in the area of, of human decision making. Why do we make the decisions that we do? Um, and, and also kind of all, and interesting is um, what, why we make the mistakes that we do. Um, I think half our life uh, we, we spend thinking about, well, that was, gr- you know, I got a lucky break there and I'm glad that happened. But then also the other half, we're sort of thinking about why did I do that? Why did I think ahead? Why didn't I could have some, done some stuff differently? And it's that second part that's kind of always interested me a lot um, in terms of trying to figure out why we don't make better decisions in some circumstances. And then critically, once we figure out why we make those mistakes, try to figure out what, what are things we can do to kind of undo them or to prevent them before they happen. And um, and I think there's probably no place where, uh, uh, you know, there, obviously there are little mistakes we make, like, you know, you go to a restaurant and, and you, you'd wish you'd gone to the other one that you were thinking about. But we're not, I'm not really interested in those types of mistakes, but rather kind of the ones that have um, life and death consequences. Um, and so, for example, uh, you know, what, what are some of the big ones in the news right now? Well, why didn't the U.S. have better preparations for pandemics? Why weren't there enough masks to go around? Why wasn't um, their earlier uh, uh, testing facilities set up. And, and in hindsight, you look back at that and say, yeah, you know, we, we saw all these clues and there was all this evidence was happening and we just didn't do it. And just and one of the, the interesting features of um, almost all disasters and the way people react to them, it's almost the same story over and over and over again. It's like, um, yeah, well, we had all these clues, and if we had only listened to them correctly and so forth, uh, we, we would have we would have never gotten ourselves in that situation. But it, the one thing is, is sort of that what motivated the book was the fact that that that, <clears throat> um, that yeah, they're mistakes, but where the mistakes come from is kind of the way our brains are built. Our, our brains are just not engineered to deal with what we call low probability, high consequence events. Um, and so what the book is all about is it talks a lot about, you know, how is our brains are constructed and why they're good for some things. Like, for example, they're really good for learning how to ride a bicycle or learning how to solve math problems or, uh, uh, you know, learning how to cook food or, or learning how to get a good mate. Uh, and that's sort of what our, where, you know, through, you know, through um, millions of years of evolution, how our brains have evolved to solve. What they're not good for is trying to figure out how to prevent bad things from happiness to us that that are very, very rare. Um, And in fact, a lot of the the things that things that normally serve us really well uh, are things which um, uh, uh, which basically get us into a lot of trouble when it comes to disasters. Uh, To me, anyway, uh, we can spend some time talking about all of the different ones. But to to me, the one which maybe maybe stands out the most is. uh, we have a, a, a real ability to forget pain, okay? And that's normally a great thing. I mean, because think about it. If we, uh, uh, you know, if women vividly remembered what it was like to give childbirth, none of us would exist, right? There would never be, there would be a first child, but never a second child. And, uh, uh, and likewise, if it, uh, you know, we really remembered how painful it was to fall off the bicycle the first time and scrape our knee, we'd never going to get back up again. So we've got this really, really good evolutionarily st- um, functional and positive instinct to basically forget pain. But then think about what that happens then when it comes to like disastrous events. All of a sudden, when we go through it, one of the common things that you see happening over and over and over again, whether it's an economic meltdown, whether it's an earthquake or whatever, people have a tendency to kind of forget how bad it was. Okay, And now all of a sudden, that's that, that same thing which serves us so well in most of life ends up coming to um, uh, bite us in the butt afterwards uh, when it comes to these rare events. Right. Yes. And um, that was one thing that pervades the book was people dying. 
I, I wondered if you could turn it into a drinking game where like you had to drink every time like a, a thousand people died for something. Uh, that, well, can, yeah, if you want to do that. Yeah, yeah, I suppose. Yeah. Right. But, but it was, but, it, but what was striking about it was just the, the sheer number of stories of people that, a uh, number of events that had happened, which could have been prevented, right? So people experience a tsunami or an earthquake, and then they start building on the on the same area again within short yeah. order. Yeah. So, so you're reminding of us this tendency in the human condition. Yeah, as as you say, to, to I suppose to think positively, which is one of the biases, and you enumerate a number of biases mm -hmm. about the future, yeah. and there are many others which which cause us to fall into this trap of. Uh, repeating m mistakes on a historic basis. Yeah, yeah, and and um, and so so I mean I gave an example of one, but really there, uh, there there's I think in the book we kind of identify six of them, and um, and and with them it, it, they resonate really really well. Like all of a sudden if you think about it, you go yeah you're right that's kind of what I do, and uh, and so so our book is sort of a lot about talking about what these biases are, and then the key thing is once we know what they are, once we know have a better feel for what our own psychologies are, why it is that we get into these trouble into trouble, then that's kind of the first step to repairing it. To try to think that that if we know it's coming, and then we can kind of do just do things to fix it. Um, uh, and and there's just you know there's so many of this. So so for example that the, the one I was just talking about was uh, uh, what I would call emotional amnesia. Um, now, the key thing about it is, is it's not like people, when it comes to disasters, forget past disasters, or forget bad things that happened to them. Um, like, uh, for example, uh, uh, when it comes to pandemic, you know, uh, so much of things leading up to it, we're talking about great pandemics of the past, um, talking about the, 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 um, um, the, um, the Spanish flu, the 1918, uh, 1919 uh, great flu pandemic. Uh, uh, you know, the plague of Justinian, you know, going back in time and, and the Black Plague in Europe. And so, so it, and it's a people obsessed with talking about past events and in uh, places that have gone through big earthquakes or hurricanes or whatever. People really do remember the events uh, or the, the last economic meltdown. But what people forget is what the amnesia comes in is the emotional amnesia. Um, it's the time, it, it's the, if we forget uh, what it felt like to go through these things. And it's the, it's the pain of forgetting uh, of, of going through it. That's what the thing that triggers action. So, so if you think about it, what usually happens right after there's an economic meltdown? What happens? Everybody says that we're, this is so bad, we're never going to let it happen again. We're, we're going we're gonna to do it right. Or, or you, know, you think this is day-to-day -day life uh, whenever we kind of make a mistake and we, you know, and uh, if you get caught doing something you shouldn't have supposed to do, what do you do? You sort of say, I'm never going to do this again. Okay, I learned my lesson. Well, you don't learn your lesson, okay? Because what happens is you, for, you know, time goes by, and you, you, you know, and, and then you forget what it felt like. You remember the event, you forget what it felt like, and um, uh, and, and so that, so that's sort of you know one of the things uh, we talk about. Um, yeah, and, and and there's sort of others um, um, that are that are very, that that's from one one category. Um, uh, but there are others. I, um, uh, for example, one thing that that uh, gets us into trouble is um, we're inherently um, um, uh, where uh, we have a tendency on the flip side to be pretty myopic, which is it's difficult to kind of think too far into the future. What are the consequences of what I do today for what the future is going to be? Um, and uh, and this is another thing which you can say, well, why aren't we better about planning for the future? Well, this is another evolutionary thing that uh, that that back in the days when uh, uh, you know thousands and thousands of years ago, you know, life was about getting from one day to the next. You know, where is my next meal going to come from? And just all of our cognitive wiring is focused on the near term. What are things we can do to to maximize pleasure or get the next meal in the short term? And we're not too much worried about, uh, well, if we go ahead and we eat up all the berries uh, in the area today, uh, then there may not be en enough berries left um, a, a year from now. Well, that's great, but I'm worried about surviving from one day to the next. And so as a consequence, we kind of tend to be really narrowly focused on the short term, which you know historically and normally gets us through pretty well. Um, uh, but, but then when it comes to things like uh, uh, um, making preventive actions these are things where you actually have to take action well before there is something bad happening um, and this for example is why climate change is such a difficult thing is a hard sell for people because you're 
you're sitting there looking around and they're going, I don't see anything. I don't see a problem. Uh, you know, sure, it's a little bit hot today, but it's always been hot. And, uh, and try to say, no, 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 it's going to get, unless you do something now, it's going to be really, it's going to be bad in the distant future. And people just can't imagine what that, what, what that would be like. And so therefore you don't take action. Right. And I'm thinking, I mean, most relevantly right now in the midst of this pandemic, I mean, in 2016, the UK ordered this study, the exercise sickness where they looked at the potential impacts of a pandemic. They knew that there may be problem uh, with, for example, ventilators were especially called out problems mm-hmm. with disposing of the dead. So, so more trees and yet nothing was done about it. It was, it was buried. And now I guess myopia may have been one of the reasons that that report wasn't acting upon. Um, many many more i mean it's it's yes it's it's uh, yeah yeah and and i think that that, that's also a really good one like a a third of the bias we talk about is um uh, optimism okay and now normally if you talk to any psychologist any positive psychologist they say optimism is good okay this is what we need we need to be optimistic we need to be positive we need to be that's how you live a healthy life i mean uh, no one likes a pessimist and no one should be negative it's 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 mentally destructive to be uh, to be down too much. And we should be optimists. We should look at the brighter side, and in, and most of the time that is good. You know that's how that's that's good mental health. But then on the other hand, where it comes back to bite you is in situations where you know there are times where you got to look at the downside. You got to look that it, it can happen to me. Um, and this is sort of maybe more than anything else is sort of a, a a thing where when all of a sudden and I can think and the the thing about it which to me is sort of interesting is as much as I study this stuff I fall into these traps exactly the same way that that it was back in January back in December and I'm hearing this stuff about uh, about you know this this uh, coronavirus in China and. I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking, wow, that's tough. You know, the people in China are really suffering from this. Glad I don't have to worry about it. You know, glad that's not going to come here. And we never have to worry about these things. And uh, uh, or, or, or and disasters tend to be things that happen to other people. And and of course, the way that and, and because they do tend to work happen to other people. Right. If you, you know, you, you see a plane crash. Well, I'm not on that plane. I'm reading about the plane crash. I'm, I'm seeing about a massive flood. Well, I, I'm high and dry. And, I'm, and, and so this kind of reinforces this idea that bad things happen to other people and they can happen to us. And so you have that experience of seeing it always happens to other people, combined with the fact that we're just naturally optimists. We like to think that we tend to be the survivors. We're, we're, we're the ones that are going to be healthy. Um, um, you know, my, you know, you go into a wedding, who thinks that they're going to get a divorce, right? And, uh, and everybody thinks divorces is what happens to other people. Um, it's not what happens to, to, to me. Okay, I'm not going to get sick. Um, that's the thing. And so when you yeah. keep applying, applying this to disasters, it's, it's a bad, it's a bad myth. Right. And actually, I think that's probably more, re- that bias is more relevant, because when I read the reporting around this, uh, this exercise sickness, that the people, some of the people who were interviewed and said, well, why was this never shared? And the sources were in government. Well, we were terrified it would, we were concerned it would terrify pe- people. I actually don't think, given what you've just said, I don't think it would have necessarily terrified people. I think much more likely it would have just kind of been ignored. It would have been like, yeah, yeah, okay, but not, yeah, 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 it's and, probably not going to happen. Or we don't really need to worry about that, do we? Yeah, right, right. And, and there, there is a thing, there's sort of a, a line of work which talks about risk communication and like, for example, how do you get people to stop uh, stop smoking? And, and there's a line of thought that says in the extreme, if you terrify people, they tend to uh, have a reaction of, 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 of turning off the message. So therefore, they say, oh, you got to be careful not to scare people. Well, you know, I think that, that there's a lot of the evidence now is that that's a little bit overstated. That isn't quite true. That in some sense, if people are hearts died in the wool optimists, and they just don't think it's ever going to happen. Really, your only option is basically to say, look, it's going to be bad. Look, you should be scared. OK. And uh, and, and then your hope is, is that that will at least kind of offset a little of this deep bad optimism and just be enough to kind of to trick get them emotionally and moving because it's emotion negative emotions are the things that get people to take action um and uh and as long as it's sort of a rational thing where they're kind of coldly reacting to it the, the reaction is going to be well you know i'll worry about it when it happens and I'll, I'll take care of it then but but really what gets people to take action is sort of is 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 you know is negative emotions it's worry it's fear it's things like that that's what what gets people to to go 
Um, so, so, you know, so in the book, we talk a lot about uh, the, the first three things I talked about were the, the, um, the kind of the, the built-in <clears throat> psychologies about how we think about risk, this idea that we tend to be forgetful of um, how bad things were in the past. Uh, we tend to plan, not plan far enough into the future. And at the core of it, we tend to be optimists. We think that whatever the bad thing is not going to happen to us. Then we, then we also spend a lot of time thinking about how is it that people, the mistakes that people make when they're reacting to the, some of these events. Um, and there's kind of three big biases that happen. Um, um, one of which is, and these are kind of, to me, has always struck me as, as really kind of interesting and they're, because uh, uh, they tend to be so true. Um, one of which is we have this bias towards, we generally call it, uh, um, I, I call it simplification. Um, right. And the idea is, is there's a, a thing that psychologists call the single action bias. And, uh, and what happens is, is, is that when things start to happen, um, uh, and, and usually for when it comes to prepare for whatever kind of disaster it is, whether it's finances, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's a, a windstorm or whatever, it's not like what you do one thing and that makes it go away. It usually you have to do a whole constellation of things to kind of prepare for it. Uh, but what people have a tendency to do is have the brain, the, our brains basically say, if you do one thing, that'll kind of take care of it. You can kind of, you, you've taken some action. Okay. And so. So, for example, uh, you look at like I'm walking around the streets here in Philadelphia and I see people wearing, fortunately, wearing masks. OK. And I think for a lot of people that does it. OK. Uh, you know, I, I got my mask on. What more do you want? OK. And um, and so I think for them that, that one of the things is it's really hard to get people to do is to. Um, is to realize that taking taking precautions it's once you do the one thing that should be the step to doing other sorts of things. Um, and and that's why, for example, we, one of my uh, uh, one of the things that I don't really like is for uh, is long giving people long checklists of things they should be doing, um, because what happens is that people look at those long checklists and they look at them and say, wow, some of this stuff applies to me. Some of it doesn't. And man, you expect me to do all these different things. Well, I don't have the time and the energy to do these 20 different things. So, but what they tend to have a tendency to do is to say, okay, well, I'll do one of them. Okay. I'll wear a mask. Okay. Or I'll, uh, um, I'll, 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 the next time I go to the grocery store, I'll, I'll keep distances between my, myself and that's it. I'm done. Okay. I, I, I did the list. I'm not going to worry about all those others. And so, um, so one of the things is that, that we really emphasize in getting, how do you overcome some of this stuff is to uh, really encourage people to, um, uh, uh, risk communicators to say, look, People aren't going to do 20 things. What, the, what, what you need to do is help people prioritize and help people to say, look, if you're going to do one thing, just one thing alone is go ahead and let's say wear a mask. But then you don't end it right there. Then you say, okay, once you've done a mask, good, checklist number one. Now you got to move on to number two and so forth and kind of work through this idea that people tend to be simplifiers. Um, yeah, um, yeah, and another one, and maybe to, to me, this is sort of, the thing which gets people into the most trouble is um, is this incident called hurting, uh, and that is this idea that we that how do we know what to do? Well, we look to other people, and usually these other people that we look to don't know have any better idea of what to do than we do, and yet we're social animals and uh, and that and that unfortunately for a lot of people that are into risk management, um, dealing with herds and dealing with herd mentality is a is a is a major thing to challenge to try to overcome. Right. And in fact, you've done some, you've done some experiments, right? Where, where you've looked at the decisions people make around in insurance decisions. And even when they knew it made sense to invest for the long term, when they started to see other people behaving in a different way, they've, they followed suit. Yeah, could you? I found that fascinating. Could you talk? That, yeah, yeah, talk yeah. We that? had some. Um, uh, yeah, so had some. Uh, and a lot of these things, by the way, are things where uh, where, where you you kind of listen to them. And you go, yeah, that's kind of right. You know, like all of a sudden, what happens when think of a pandemic? What immediately what you did was you call your neighbors and you say, um, uh, is it safe to go out yet? You know, are, are we are you social distancing? And, and if your neighbor says, oh yeah, you've got to stay in, then you stay in. On the other, but this isn't. These are not professionals. These are not people who. You, you know, they don't know any more than you do. Yet, yet we have a tendency to kind of basically group decide. And so, yeah. So we, we so one of the things we did was we ran some experiments in which we played effectively like an online game. Uh, and one, we've done a number of these. Like one that comes to mind is one we did 
on earthquake preparedness. And people had a tendency, had the ability to kind of build safer houses. Uh, and the way in which he, and, and then at any point an earthquake could hit. Uh, and so, uh, and, and what we did was we basically told people um, uh, that, that you either, that this build, building a safer house could be something which could be very effective or not very effective. Um, and the key thing with, 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 with prevention is you never know uh, what's the right time to build because it co it's costly to build. And, you know, maybe the best thing to do is if you don't build at all, then you save all that money and you can kind of roll the dice that an earthquake boom hit. So what we did was we let, we let people kind of watch what other people were doing. And even when we basically told them, look, the way we make the most money in this game is as soon as the game starts, take your money, build a safe house, and then you're good. Okay. And then, uh, but then what happens is, is people just don't do it. And then what they do is they look to see what other people are doing. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and I should say, by the way, a lot of that, we, we did this with people of different ages and so forth. And, uh, uh, one thing we found is with, with college undergraduates when they were playing with this, um, uh, we went ahead and, uh, uh, and I noticed there was this group of uh, uh, these are undergraduate guys and undergraduate girls playing, okay? And women, have a, or women are smarter than men when it comes to risk, okay? They're, they're just as one of the fundamental truths of, of life is that women tend to be more risk averse than men are. Uh, and so what happened was, is that normally what we find in this game is if a couple people begin self-building safer houses, then pretty much that gets other people to build safer houses. But in this one, it was strange because I noticed that the, um, uh, that the, the three women that were in this group, there were six of them, the three women all built safer houses, and then the men didn't at all. And so, so afterwards, I went to the, the three guys who were there, and I said, why didn't you build safer houses? And they saw, well, we saw the girls were building safer houses. And so therefore we didn't, we didn't see the need. They're probably, you know, overly risk averse and so forth. So anti-herding. Um, yeah. Or, anti -herding, at least, right? or at least still perfected herding or something. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think we see it. I mean, it's interesting how we'll take a, f a s and you talk about like the simplification bias, a small number of cues. And uh, for what's interesting to me is looking at the different, um, way that populations have handled a pandemic, right? Kind of, Sweden had, had not taken a stringent lockdown at all. That I think they've they've taken just a small cues, a few a, few, a small set of cues from their government, and they've made a as a population, it seems they've made an entirely different set of choices around lockdown. We we only need a, a few a few instructions from the government here, and and it really is mass compliance. It really really was quite phenomenal to see the yeah. just the the level of compliance. And I think even our government didn't expect in their modelling for us to have as a population to have been as compliant as we have. And and yeah. and across across you know across the ocean in Sweden, they've taken a different set of cues, and they've equally uh, heard it in a completely different way. Yeah, yeah. So sometimes, in, in some sense, we like to say that, you know, how do you fix this? Well, herding is at one time uh, uh, kind of the greatest nemesis for uh, why people don't prepare, but it also, is in some sense, is the, the single best way of, of, of overcoming it. Um, that it's, I can't convince you that, um, uh, that you're going to die from the pandemic. Okay, I can't, you're just too much of an optimist. I, I can't get you to kind of imagine what it would be like to be violently ill. You just can't imagine that. On the other hand, if I could just say, look, you see everyone else doing it, okay, then in some sense, then you, it, we just have a natural instinct to want to go along. Um, um, one of the things we talk about in the book, though, is sort of the, the, uh, the scary downsides of hurting. Um, <clears throat> and um, and so, for example, one of the things is that that uh, uh, where, where it really becomes to hurt is in situations where uh, all of a sudden um, where where groups are suddenly faced with threat and no one knows what to do. Okay, and that and that's a, a really that's going to be the single greatest danger that can happen. Where um, uh, and in the book, I talk about uh, like nightclub flyer flyers, and you know, and often kind of one of the great um, misnomers when it comes to nightclub fires and that sort of thing is what happens is as soon as people sell smoke they immediately rush to the door and basically try to get out for safety but it, but it turns out that people have looked at kind of the timeline of these events is that it um uh, is that's the that's not what happens actually when people first smell smoke 
they don't know what's going on and their first instinct is not to run from the door because that's a that's basically leaving the group right it's sort of taking a solitary action that i don't care about all you guys i'm out of here okay that's not what people do what people do is they look at their friends and they say there's safety in numbers there's safety in a herd and um and so and what happens is that you end up losing um critical moments in that um in mass shootings it's the same thing people have a ten, you, you kind of look at this these stories and say, well, why didn't why didn't the person just immediately run out, or why didn't the person do this, or why didn't the person break out? Well, because our instinct is to try to stay together and and so forth. And so in that situation, this otherwise really good instinct is to, to find safety in numbers, safety in a crowd, is um, actually can be absolutely fatal. Um, but on the other hand, uh, uh, it, you know, in in the case of, um, of pandemics, you can also flip that the other way, and if you can get people to use that same instinct to basically do positive things, then then it can be also your key to success. Yeah, and I'm just imagining, I'm sort of speculating in my mind here, you know, if in the case of preparing for this pandemic, let's say the World Health Organization had picked up some countries and said, well, you know, these countries have already got you know, X supplies of PPE and ventilators in case of a pandemic, which we believe has this percentage over 50 years. Do you want, you know, if, if you're not, would you want to join this club or pro providing kind of incentives to join the herd in some way, right? And, and play on that bias, right? And this is what you talk about at the, at the end of the book is let's work with these biases. How can we find mechanisms right. to work right. with these biases to, to achieve the outcomes we want? Yeah, 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 and um, uh, and and I think also it's a thing where uh, it also helps overcome, uh, which was sort of the the six of the of the biases we talked about, or the um, or one of the three uh, obstacles to kind of good preparedness, which is uh, I call the inertia bias, and and uh, and what it is is this is there is a tendency uh, uh, for us to kind of keep doing the stuff we're used to doing, and. Um, and so usually one of the real threats to uh, when it comes to preparing for rare events or things that we don't know or pandemics is that that it's not like we know for sure what's the right thing to do. OK, so uh, so in some sense, it, it's like it, it's the case of um, uh, you have news media or, or um, health professionals saying, look, you know, the pandemic's a real threat, you know, and. Um, uh, and, you know, if for people who are younger, it probably is not as much a threat, but you got to be careful about older people. And uh, and it goes and it gets and, and the more that these details you hear, the more complicated it gets. And all of a sudden you go, wow, I don't really know what I should be doing. You know, is it safer to do this? Is it safer to be doing that? Or uh, one of the big problems we have with with evacuations. Um, is that often the biggest thing that causes people not to evacuate is not that they don't think that they should evacuate, but they don't know to, when to evacuate. Right. Um, and you're sitting there and going, uh, uh, you really need to get out of here. Well, does that mean like in the next two seconds? Does that mean in the next 15 minutes? Does that mean in an hour? Am I, can, I, can I wait? To, do I have enough time to get my stuff together? Okay. And so in some sense, and then what happens is the, law, the more indecision there is, the more people basically revert back to this instinct of what we call the status quo or just or, or basically just keeping doing what we're doing. Um, and um, uh, and so what happens is, is that that one of the things that that uh, that we have to kind of do is sort of um, uh, and that's maybe the, the bottom reason why often people don't. Uh, aren't don't take enough safety measures because in life um, taking safety measures is uh, is not the kind of the norm what we, we tend not we, we tend to not be stocking up on things and whatnot so if in doubt we tend not to take the safe measure um, so so what we as you mentioned so one of the things, the things that we do kind of towards the end of the book is say um, okay now that we know all of the stuff about why people make mistakes how do we leverage that uh, and what are things that we can do by being better psychologists about ourselves to make sure that we don't do these things again? Um, and uh, and so, like the last one, for example, is um, uh, if it's the case that that we have a default in our mind or a status quo, which is not to take preparedness. Or uh, and and I think a great example is in um, in COVID um, that 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 there there hadn't been the norm to get like a, a large number of ventilators. There hadn't been the norm to uh, keep the U.S. supplied with testing um, or face masks or whatever it is. 
Um, and, and so, but if you kind of flip that and just sort of say, okay, the norm is going to be that every year we kind of over prepare for this stuff and we, and this is basically becomes the default, then, then automatically people will kind of fall into that or, um, an, another you call one, it we, the, the, the ghost choice, which I loved as a term, right? It's the, it's the choice we're making, but not really consciously acknowledging that we're making it. Right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a, it, it, uh, and so, um, uh, so, so, so in some sense, every decision that we make, a decision not to do something is a decision. So, yeah. uh, uh, and, and so, for example, um, uh, what often happens, one of the problems that people have with insurance is they let it lapse, okay, and by not doing something. And so one of the things that, uh, that for example, what happens in uh, the, the, the United States, the uh, federal government has flood insurance. And uh, actually, I'm not so sure what it is in the UK, whether private companies do it or whether it's... Uh, uh, Done by the, uh, the the government, but but in the U.S. it's the federal government does it, and uh, mainly because the private insurers don't want to mess around with floods uh, and or water damage. And uh, so one of the things that happens with flood insurance is that that whenever people see that there's been a flood, like um, in past years it was Hurricane Katrina, and the news media was filled with all pictures of people underwater. And then what happens is is people say, whoa, I think I might need flood insurance. And they go out and get flood insurance and they pay maybe $1,000 for flood insurance. And then they get it. And then the year goes by and almost by definition, there's no flood. And so what happens is the next year, all of a sudden they get a bill for a thousand, do you want to renew your flood insurance for $1,000? And you go, wow, I don't know, you know, I, you know, I, I, I probably I should probably, you know, I don't know, probably I should. But uh, at the end, all of a sudden, you don't have it anymore. Okay, it's not like you've ever made a decision not to do it because you have every intention to go ahead and get flood insurance at some point. But it's just the default is just not to do it, not to take action. And so therefore, by, by postponing it, by not thinking about it, you are effectively making the decision not to do it. And so some of the things that, you know, we've been thinking about is, how do you flip it? Okay, how do you make it such that not taking that preventive action, that's the assertive choice. So for example, something as simple as saying, look, your, your policy is automatically going to be renewed, okay? And uh, uh, maybe we take it out, if you have a mortgage, we'll take it out of your mortgage payment. It's just part of living. And, and then, but if you want, we're not gonna make you do it. If you really don't, if you really wanna take the risk, um, here's a form you can sign that says, I hereby want my money back and I do not want to have insurance. Then you flip it the other way because then you're thinking, oh, wow, you know, do I really want to take that risk? Do I re you know, and then you th then basically you're taking that same bias and flipping it. And now all of a sudden people are keeping insurance rather than uh, letting it uh, fall by the wayside. Right. Yeah. And I think you also mentioned about giving people actually a, a bonus so they actually experience something, a positive reward, right, for, for continuing to invest in prevention for the long term. So right, right. And, the and, reward. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and so like you can give com people constant rewards for doing it that's the same. And then uh, and you can kind of go through some of these others. Like, for example, we could say, uh, um, uh, OK, I already gave the example of like simplification, this tendency to go, I only want to do one thing and then fit problems are and i'm confused by long checklists okay we'll work with people just take it as a given look they're only going to do one thing so given that they're only going to do one thing what's the one thing you want them to do okay then once they've got that once you've got compliance on that now move to a second thing and so forth and you know it's not rocket science it's just pretty straightforward or uh, uh or you know and i we gave the example of herding in you know, the tendency to just follow the uh follow the cloud what crowd well you can make that be a positive um and and by by by, by giving people you know um uh, uh social incentives to do good things um uh and you know and encourage mass behavior on a positive way um that, well, the things that are a little bit harder to overcome are the ones that are the more deeply rooted um, ones, like like optimism, for example. How do you get people to be really worried about uh, uh, um, you know what it would be like to become really fatally ill, or how do you get people to be imagine what it would be like to have your house destroyed in a windstorm or or be flooded? And that's just that's just really really hard. Um, uh, uh, and so we, you know, we've tried things like um, uh, developing simulations where you get people to you actually kind of living in 
it, living through a, through a, a storm or living through a flood or living through a hurricane. And it's just really, it, it's hard to get people, if it's not real, to actually experience what, what it's like. And so trying to overcome uh, this intense, the tendency we have to offer optimism is, is hard. Um, and um, the other one is um, uh, like, like trying to get people to, um, uh, uh, to remember what past disaster, how they felt in past disasters is often hard. And the only thing you can really do is sort of say, um, remember that past event, okay, well, or remember the, the last time we had a financial meltdown, don't remember the financial meltdown, try as hard as you can to remember what it was really like to go through it. Okay, and do you really want to go with that again? And really kind of focus in most on people's on emotional memories rather than objective memories. Yeah, and as you say that, when I think about how we tend to relay history, it tends to be in, in facts and figures and you know, the, the, um, the, the pertinent facts of an event, right? We don't tend to try and recreate experiences for people, right? It's not in the culture so much as it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and like, why do we keep having wars? I mean, what's, what's the story there? Uh, you know, you would think that after, uh, whether you're the winner or the loser, I mean, I mean, it's just so painful of an experience to go through. And uh, uh, yet, we, it, it, you're right, the, the longer the gap is, we tend to remember these past events as numbers, they're uh, political actors, they're, this happened, that happened, but, you, but, but, uh, but, 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 you know, but it certainly is the case when it's a generational thing, where I just don't, I can't possibly remember what my grandparents experienced going through such a thing. And, uh, and so as a consequence, we just kind of experience these things over and over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and it's, I mean, it's striking to me what the, the, I suppose the power of this work and at the moment, at least how, how it's not really part of popular consciousness. I mean, you've applied it to risk prevention and, uh, or risk management, should I say, a disaster prevention. Right. Um, but it, but it could. I mean, this, this. Why aren't we talking more about this in terms of building social movements, in terms of changing organisations, in terms of transforming community? I mean, it's it, that this question of oh, what. The, I mean, well, what biases should we be considering here, and what are we doing to think about how we can either use uh, biases or mitigate against them? It, it, it doesn't seem to pervade general consciousness. You know, we talk about goals and values and purpose and what we want to achieve but i don't know it seems somewhat absent from the general conversation about how right, how right. we lead and manage human beings yeah yeah I, and, and i think about it and this is sort of the it's not just my work but then it's just also there's a, a growing movement of work uh, what's called um, um uh, you know a cognitive architecture or uh and, and the idea is to say um uh, say look uh, an awful lot of the way in which we try to get people to live better lives is telling people what they should do Okay. And, uh, and you can remember, and this is, you know, this is the way we are. It's sort of like when you're growing up, if you're a parent, uh, you're telling your kids, uh, do this, do your homework, do, you need to do better. You don't do that and so forth. And it's a lot of us sort of projecting the end states on people and telling them what they should be doing. And, uh, and, and sort of saying, look, you know, you've got to do a better job of preparing for these things. We've got to do this. We've got to do that. Uh, well, in some sense, that's really, really naive because trying to get people to do stuff which they're not naturally inclined to do is like taking, you know, a, a, you know, a, a 10,000 pound ball and trying to run it up, that force it up the hill because people are just not going to, to do it. And so the, the way we've got to start is to say, OK, let's stop trying to make people uh, convince them rationally that they ought to be buying insurance uh, or they, they should be they should be engaging in better personal safety. Um, you know, how do you take a teenager and get them to uh, to stop engaging in risky behaviors, whether it's uh, you know, sexual behaviors, whether it's drug consumption, whether it's cigarettes? How do you get them? Well, sitting there and telling them, don't do that. OK not good for you don't do that okay it's well, like eat your five a day is the other one that we yeah yeah right, right. what you've got to do is that you, you you know you have to sit there and ask yourself the question why is it that they're doing it what are the and once we kind of understand what those levers are basically create an environment around them that basically uh, uh that's such that that they're naturally going to be inclined to do to do kind of the right thing um by uh by by realizing that you know i have a uh, one of my best friends and uh, who I first came into the field with is uh, uh, named Eric Johnson. He's a, um, uh, he does a lot of work in choice architecture and he's at uh, yeah, Columbia University. Uh, and he did this uh, totally fascinating study that was become very famous over, it was a number of years ago, 
uh, and we did very, very simple analysis. We looked at the, uh, uh, of all the different countries in Europe and what are the proportions of people who, um, uh, uh, who have our, who list themselves as a donor, an organ donor on their li on their um, licenses, driver's licenses. And, and what you find is extreme variation. And the most interesting one was um, uh, in uh, Germany versus Austria. And I believe it's the case that in Germany, uh, it's something like, you know, uh, like 98% of people are over organ, diner, organ donors, but in Austria, it's like two or 3%. And I may, I'm, I'm sure I have the numbers a little bit off. And so the, 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 the issue is, what, how could that possibly be? You know, these are countries right next to each other, they speak the same language, culturally very similar. And the, and the difference is very, very simple. In, in one country, in Germany, the default is uh, you are an organ donor and you have to opt out. In, in Austria, you have to opt in. And so what happens is, is when people uh, are kind of given that opportunity, uh, you know, who wants to basically opt out of being it when that seems to be the norm? Okay. And likewise, in Austria, it seems to be the fact that you have to opt into it sort of suggests it's the norm not to do it. And, and also, likewise, who it's not a thing we like to think about. You know, what would happen if we die in an auto crash? I mean, who wants to think about that? So as a consequence, we just block it out of our mind and we don't think about it. So but what's interesting there and the point that he was trying to make is the idea that that both these people are making choices, okay? And they don't think that they're making choices. The people in, uh, in Germany are not thinking that they're becoming an organ donor, and people in Austria are not thinking that they're not being an organ donor, but basically they're still making choices. But that simple change in legislation, which is the default and uh, opt-in versus opt-out, has enormous behavioral implications. Um, uh, and, and it's not forcing people to do what they don't want to do. Um, in both cases, you have the option. You're not restricting free will. It's just basically taking what we know about people's psychologies and nudging them one way or the other uh, in a way which is, um, uh, which they would probably also say in the long run is better for them. Right. And what about the people who sort of may, may critique this? There's a kind of creepy element to it, you know, that there's sort of this invisible hand trying to nudge me and manipulate me in one way or another. What, what, what do you say to that critique? Uh, that's good. I mean, I'm in marketing. I'm a marketing professor, and that's what we do, uh, uh, you know, and, and that sort of a thing. And, uh, you know, just for example, I have a colleague uh, in the department who does work in uh, – how just simple things uh, that we do in life, like using uh, smartphones versus computers, affect the way in which we make decisions. And so she has these fascinating results, which she came up with. And these are not an experiment. This is with, so she has some experiments, but this is done with very, very large scale data showing that people are more likely to, uh, to offer up personal information if you ask them on their smartphones than you ask them on their on their computers and so and the reason is is that you know we think about our smartphones is that they're that we talk to our families with them and or they're with us all the time and they're like security blankets and uh and and so what happens is, is when people get into this mindset of relaxation when they're on their phone and they're more likely to turn over personal information and so so you know and so this is where sort of marketing gets a little bit kind of iffy uh it's that we're 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 going ahead and so the implication would be you know if you want personal information from people got to you know contact them on their smartphones and uh and 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 so we're also basically you, know, you can think about that or you can turn that for the positive um, that if you want to find, if you want to reach people in the context of disasters and you want to uh um, uh, get people to do things and so forth. It's more personal to reach them on their personal device, uh, their their smartphone device, and so forth. And uh, you know, so is that is, is, is I so I think like all these things, it's um, uh, is this good or bad? Well, it's the uh, it's it, at some point it's sort of a moral decision of what's the the long if if you're doing something that's going to make the, that's really going to be better for them in the long run, such that in my definition of that <clears throat> would be. If they had the option after down the road to look back, and if they said, look, somebody did a nudge to me that I wasn't really aware it was happening, and it was a little bit creepy when it happened, but, uh, but reality is, is that now I have a house where I wouldn't have had a house. Now I'm still alive, and I wouldn't have been alive. Then, you know, I, I think most people would say, yeah, go ahead and do it. It's probably the right thing to do. Uh, but, you know, but obviously these, these same tricks and these same instruments can also be used for bad. And, um, and that's just something where, um, um, you know, we, we, we have to live with it. And, um, 
um, and, and you just hope that that there's enough morality out there that that people will know that it will tend that the the good uses of these things will tend to greatly outweigh the more negative right yeah and i suppose is, is it the question in my mind then is there a sort of body of ethics now which is looking at this is there a kind of attendant you know Oh yeah, uh, yeah, field of ethics around choice architecture and nudge theory and, and these associated. Uh, yeah, sure. sure. Things, so, for yeah. example, I, I'm beginning to do a lot of work in the area of artificial intelligence, and that, of course, is is huge. Um, where all of a sudden, um, uh, you know, you're, the, the 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 information that we're getting about the world is basically driven by by uh, AI algorithms who are constantly watching where we are and. Uh, uh, and so, um, and so, for example, um, I, I'm, I'm in kind of a, a research group that that because of COVID, um, there's basically the, the the government is watching where everybody is all the time, and now they're doing it for uh, what you might think is kind of a good reason, uh, and they're publishing these data, which basically show because we need to know uh, in order to be able to forecast. Uh, how what the risk is and how what the spread is going to be. We need to know a lot of information of how much social distancing is happening. Okay, and so how do we know that? Well, we got to find out where people are. Well, how do we find out that? Well, we look to see where they are in their smartphones, and uh, and so there's an awful lot of very very personal data which are being gathered, uh, and here it's for a good perp a good supposedly a, you know a, a good reason. It's trying to keep us all healthy. Uh, but then at the same time, if you, you know, if, if I'm sitting here and I'm knowing that as I go and I walk outside and I walk by the grocery store uh, and I'm within three feet, feet of people, that's all of a sudden there's going to be, you know, the satellite up in the sky and the federal government are watching me. And all of a sudden, you know, I, it's you get a loud scary, speaker you know? moment. Stand back. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Move stand away. Back, you know, it's, it's, it's scary stuff. And, uh, uh, you know, and and it's like all these things. I mean, it, 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 all, these things can be. You know, incredibly positive and i and and i think that uh, that that hopefully in the end that, that there's enough morality out there that that the good uses of these things will kind of tend to dominate the more negative and we're never going to get rid of the more negative so um, um you know that sort of thing so yeah and and i think from into especially in terms of the field that you're uh, you know you're dealing with this sort of crisis prevention I mean, I mean two thoughts come to mind is one is as as we improve as a species at dealing with the things that the normal things that tend to kill us <laughs> and we may yeah. be doing better or worse at say, in some of those mm. areas right it will become more important for us to focus on those abnormal events right, right. um so, so so that's one thing that sort of comes to mind and then the second thing that comes to mind is having read um Nassim Taleb you know back swan I'm currently reading it just before I came on the set and one of the things that he talks about is the fact that as we become more connected as a society complexity increases will become increasingly dominated by these black swan events these extreme events and so for that reason uh our ability to prevent long-time disasters and think about the long term and these these singular events maybe it becomes more important yeah absolutely um uh, and, and so if, if you think about it, i mean there's this sort of this all the thing about uh uh you know we always fight the last or, and, and so, uh, unfortunately, the downside of a lot of uh, disaster preventiveness is, is we look at events that have already happened and how do we, we kind of obsess over how to make sure that that's not going to happen again? Well, in, in some sense, it's uh, you know, that's good. You know, I'm glad we do that. And, and certainly for the more frequent sorts of things um, uh, that I really hope, for example, that that there'll be just one massive lesson learned from this, uh, from COVID that, uh, uh, that basically, and, and I can guarantee you that, that, that if this was like, there's a new virus two years from now, uh, people really will remember what happened and they'll take go overboard trying to make sure. Um, now, now, whether it will happen, if it's going to be more likely, if it's a 50, 70 years before there's the next event, my guess is that people will have forgotten and we'll kind of go through it again. But but you're right, that the thing that, that um, that's the scariest and um, the things that are hardest to prepare for are the ones that we just, we don't know about. Um, and we don't know, uh, like, uh, uh, it, and uh, in, in some sense, afterwards, you, you could always say, well, we kind of didn't know about it. We kind of were able to forecast it. But when there are these very, very rare events, um, it, they're just impossible. Like, uh, who would have forecast, um, uh, you know, the, the 9/11 attacks, for example, or the extremity of that? Um, uh, and, and this was, we sort of knew that there was a threat out there, but it was just unimaginable that it could occur on that scale. And 
Um, and, and likewise, even with COVID, for all the warnings that were out there that, look, this thing is starting up in China, uh, you know, and we really ought to be super, super careful. Uh, countries around the world just couldn't imagine that it would happen, okay? And this, these are not black swan events. This is not this rare event that just came out of the blue. It's an asteroid, unexpected asteroid hitting us. This is something that's predictable, so, so, which is really scary because if we can't, you know, if we can't, if we have trouble dealing with, the, with potentially the knowable events, the ones that we can't predict, what are our chances of getting with the really rare ones? And um, uh, so, so and, but I think for my, me anyway, the starting point is just to say, look, um, we have to kind of, rather than thinking these things are never going to occur, we have to start thinking about um, robust preparedness measures that will allow us to kind of um, uh, prepare for whatever it is. Um, and so, you know, things like, um, uh, the, you know, the, 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 um, most governments, for example, encourage homes to have um, robust supplies of preparedness all the time. Okay, and you should have uh, every home should have uh, uh, plans in place for what they need to do should they ever have to evacuate for whatever reason. Who knows what it is? A gas leak. Uh, um, you know, asteroid, meteor hits your house. It doesn't matter what it is. It's a, so you think through what are the things that we can do to make sure that if you need to contact people, always have it be, be able to contact them. Always have a plan for where you're going to go. Always have supplies that allow you to, if anything should happen, be able to get through several days. And, and these are kind of small things. And, 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 and um, but the, the big, the harder thing is then to get people to actually do it. So. Right. And if you, fa so the, that's interesting. So you personally, then, what are some of the, some of the measures that you take given that? Oh, you've asked me a very embarrassing question. Uh, 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 very little of it. Okay, and and, so, and, and I, I actually thrive in that because I, I think that that um, that the worst people you can get to give advice are the people that are, are the kind of the do gooders, you know. And in some sense, what you want is uh, is is you want somebody who basically I, there's a thing, for example, that uh, in I, you know, obviously, I'm a university professor, and uh, and I teach statistics some, somewhat. And so, uh, so one of the things that that, that always comes out is you, you, your best math teachers are the are the people who can't do math themselves. Okay, because in some sense, they can kind of really understand what it's like to be not a math whiz or not a statistics whiz and so forth. And so, I, I think it's the same thing here is is that that um, that I'm really bad at it. Okay, and, you don't uh, have a bunker with six months of yeah, dry food. And, and I could tell you, like uh, it was a, a number of years ago in Hurricane Sandy. Uh, we're fortunate enough to have a, a second home um, near the water in the state of Delaware, and we have a, a boat that sets out front. And then, uh, and I knew the hurricane was coming, and we have it up on the lift. And I put the lift up six feet. And uh, and I looked at that boat sitting up sturdily on the lift, and I and I and I looked at it. I said, "Well, that's going to be fine." And then uh, and then I left, and you know, and, and and all that sort of stuff. And then uh, a few days later, when the storm hit, I get a phone call from someone down there and said, uh, "said You've heard about your boat, right?" And I go, "No, I haven't heard about my boat." They go, well, it's sitting out on the street, okay. And so it's <laughs> like, you know. I do this stuff. I study this stuff, you know, and how could I be falling prey to the very things that I'm trying to write a book about, about how it's difficult to imagine the extreme event. And you no, know, now I learn from it now. So I keep the thing tied down and, and so forth. And, and it's just really, really hard. And, um, but, but I think that the place to start is, is basically uh, is just kind of realizing that we have what these biases are and really kind of remind ourselves over and over and over again, say, am I being too optimistic? Okay, am I really remembering how painful it was in the past? Am I thinking through the future consequences? Um, you know, am I, um, uh, you know, what are the defaults that I'm falling back into? And are those the right defaults? Um, you know, am I oversimplifying? Am I just doing one thing and should, should I be doing others? And, um, uh, you know, and maybe, you know, and, and, and knowing that we have this instinct to follow the herd, making sure that I'm following the right herd and not the wrong herd. Well, fascinating stuff. And uh, yes, I uh, thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. Uh, yeah, I, it's been fun. It's, it's, it's fun. Uh, and I hope get you know, and I, I as I said, I think this this of course has you know applicability in in your field, but um, yeah, I suspect we'll see, and probably am seeing. I'm just not aware of it. This this percolating through other fields and becoming more yeah, and more yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It, part of the consciousness. Yeah. Right. And, and the book, the book is kind of a, it's a short read and it's got some stories in it. And so it's kind of a, a recommended thing. And oh, I should say, finally, the last thing I should say is the, uh, 
uh, we call it the ostrich paradox. And so people kind of wonder, well, that's kind of a weird title for it. And, and actually it came from the fact that my co-author kept using the term, well, we, we put our heads in the sands like ostriches. Okay. And so, uh, and, and then that's sort of a, a famous misnomer that actually ostriches don't put their head in the sands. And, uh, and we tend to think of ostriches as people basically won't face up to risks and have silly at but actually, it's just the it's it's actually the opposite. I mean, the um, uh, ostriches are probably the one of the most incredibly adaptive bird, flightless birds that exists. I mean, they're incredibly good. They're they're one of the fastest land animals uh, in in the fields of Af in the in the plains of Africa. They they have a tendency to kind of go completely flat to make themselves invisible. So what they've been able to do is basically they have all these inherent physical biases. They can't fly and so forth. And what they've been able to do is um, is adapt to risk by basically taking, uh, leveraging the limitations that they have and making them be positive. They can't fly, so they become super good runners and so forth. And so the kind of the lesson is to say that we need to be kind of more like ostriches rather than less like ostriches, kind of go ahead and look at the biases and the limitations that we have and kind of flip them and make them be positives rather than negatives. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. And uh, and I have to say I love the way you wrote the book. Yes, it 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 does. It's 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 a short book, but it really packs. You know, it really packs in. In fact, I wish all sort of technical writers um, or nonfiction writers wrote in that way. Right? Every you've got a story to make the point. You elaborate on some of the, the technical concepts. You recap on the concepts, and then it's done. Like next chapter, it's just it. It's yeah. so concise. It, it, I just, I just. It's almost like I want to take that template and, and give it. Well, that's give good. It to I, the world. You know, that. that's how that's uh, how yeah. nonfiction should be should be well written, right? Because yeah, I think all writers like positive nice. reinforcement, and so I, I certainly appreciate that. It was really yeah. yeah. It's uh, yeah. it's it's uh, it's very readable. Um, yeah, no, I know. I I really enjoyed it. Good. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Really enjoyed the, the conversation. Well, thank you. It was links, a fun conversation. The, we'll have put uh, the links to the book. Anything else that you'd point people to um, other than the book itself? Uh, well, I guess just um, uh, stay safe and, uh, and learn the lessons from the book and, uh, and hope we can kind of uh, get on the other side of this and we'll, life will be back to normal in a, few, in, a, in a few weeks. Yeah. Spoken like a true optimist. Yeah, <laughs> that's all right. All right. Okay. Thank you so right. much. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.